Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you for the invitation here as well. Uh, I have to admit I feel a little bit like uh, the new kid on the first day at school. Uh, I actually know very little about audio and video. I, I don't work with them directly. Uh, I work with a lot of scientific research data that does include audio and video, and I'll talk a little bit about the implications there. Uh, I actually met Chris through uh, a Blue Ribbon Task Force on Sustainable Digital Preservation and Access. And at the uh, final symposium for this task force, uh, John Landau gave a talk <coughs> about Avatar. And what I found out at that time is the Oscars, the Science and Technology Council in particular, are apparently obligated to preserve any film that gets nominated for Best Picture. And when Avatar was nominated for Best Picture, uh, they, they had a problem on their hands because this was so fundamentally different than anything they had dealt with previously. It changed the landscape. And I'm going to basically talk about that kind of a moment in time, if you will, that's happening over and over again in lots of different research disciplines uh, that you might find at a university. And I hope find some common areas and common ground because as strange as it sounds, some of the work that we're doing with scientific research data may actually have some relevance with your work and I certainly have heard things here today and, and previously that have relevance for our work. So I'm really here hoping just to find some areas of, of common interest. Where I come from is the libraries at Johns Hopkins. We are charged with building a large data archive uh, for all of the research output of our university. Uh, Hopkins is the largest recipient of federal grant funding dollars for the last 30, 35 years. I don't know exactly the right number. Just to give you a sense of the order of magnitude, we get just under $2 billion of funding uh, from the federal government in any given year. The vast majority of that is medical, uh, but as you might imagine, there are lots of other disciplines, lots of other grants. So we have a fairly large uh, remit or problem on our hands. And even beyond the university, many, many, if not most of our faculty members are now collaborating uh, with their colleagues at other institutions and universities. And I'll be talking a little bit about one of those projects. Uh, I've led for the past few years something called the Data Conservancy. Uh, this was a $10 million award through the National Science Foundation. Uh, I've been the principal investigator or the project director for that. And a lot of the work that, you'll, uh, that I'll be talking about uh, comes from that particular effort. So just quickly, the, the sort of the points that I want to lay out for you, we've been using uh, what we call a data management stack model uh, to describe some of the work we do, and I'll, I'll go over that a little bit. I, I want to include a, a definition for preservation because one of the interesting things I note about coming to conferences where I don't typically attend is we may be talking about the same things, but we use different words, uh, or we may be using the same words and be talking about different things. So I think it may be helpful at, at, some, at some level for me to give you this definition of what constitutes preservation in our context. Uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, or SDSS, is a large community uh, digital astronomy project that has been running for over 20 years now. We've been involved with that community for over a decade over that 20 years, uh, and that's the main uh, case study that I'll, I'll be describing today. And then a few comments about possible similarities in terms of our communities, our problems, and maybe our approaches, and then a, a, a call for maybe what are some grand challenges we might try to address together. What you see here uh, is a poster that we submitted to something well, called the International Digital Curation Conference a couple of years ago. And you don't need to worry about all, all the sort of nitty gritty detail on the sides. Um, but what I think would be most important to focus on is this center kind of stack here. You see this cube. And there are four rows in that uh, particular stack. There's storage, archiving, preservation, and curation. Now, one of the things that happened at Hopkins when we start, first started dealing with our researchers in terms of data management is they would use these words interchangeably. They would say, I am preserving my data. I don't need your help. Uh, or I, I know what to do when I'm archiving the data and so on. And what we found is that not surprisingly, these are experts in their domain. They're not necessarily experts in data management. Uh, they were using these terms to mean different things, and we thought it was really important to come up with a common framework and a common model so that we could have communication with them. And I'm not implying this is, you know, it's a canonical model that everybody needs to use, uh, but it is one that we have found very helpful in our conversations at, at Hopkins and now beyond. I'm told that this is being used in some of the library and information science schools and some of the data management training that takes place within particular communities and, and domains. Uh, 
And it's a hierarchical model in the sense that storage is necessary but not sufficient for archiving, and archiving is, is necessary but not sufficient uh, for preservation and then so on up to curation. And by storage, uh, you know, I mean what you might imagine, bits on tape, disk, in the cloud uh, with some sort of backup and restore capability. Archiving the next layer up in the stack is where you start to talk about data integrity, data protection, things like fixity, uh, identifiers, so that you can validate that the data, in fact, have not become corrupted, either over time or because of media issues or because of transfer issues and, and so on. And then the next layer is what we call preservation. Uh, and I will give a definition, a, a more detailed definition than the next slide. But it's really mainly about the context, it's about the metadata, it's about the representation information that you have to attach to the data in order for it to be interpreted and to be used uh, and used uh, over time. And then ultimately at the top of this layer is uh, what we call curation. And by curation, what we mean is that it is used and reused in unanticipated ways. So in a research team, the astronomers or the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, for example, create the data for a particular purpose. And they create it and treat it and uh, describe it with those purposes in mind. But increasingly, the kinds of problems we're looking at in our society, you know, take your pick, climate change, food security, internet security, um, you know, crime, it, it doesn't matter. They're all becoming large, multidisciplinary kinds of problems. And you need to bring lots of different kinds of data into the mix and lots of different kinds of methods into the mix. And that doesn't happen unless you have curation. So the ultimate measure and success of curation is that someone who didn't create the data can come along and use it uh, in, in some unanticipated way. One of the people that we've been working with through the Data Conservancy is someone named Ruth Durer. Uh, she's a data science scientist at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. And during one of our meetings, she somewhat sort of casually made this statement about what she thinks is data preservation. This is actually consistent with the OAIS reference model uh, for archiving and preservation. So if you're familiar with that model, this should look, uh, look familiar to you. But as you can see, it's really about somebody other than the original data producer being able to use your data. So right now, in many scientific domains, if I want to use data that you've produced, I basically have to contact you. And then you have to basically agree to share your data with me. And then you have to tell me how that data is described. So for example, if I said, I am doing research in an area that you're exploring, could you please send me the data you have for temperature and salinity readings in the ocean? You could say no, and that would be the end of it. You could say yes, and you could send me a spreadsheet and when I open the spreadsheet, I could look at the column headers and see SB2, GR9, and not know what any of those things mean. I might be able to infer that what these readings are, but if I don't have the context, if I don't have, in some cases, code books, if I don't have things of that nature, just sending me the data is not enough. So over time, this becomes even more complicated because I may want to give you my data and I may have forgotten what those column headers are. I'm not deliberately trying to make it somewhat challenging for you to use my data, I just may not remember. So a successful data preservation activity is one where we are no longer idiosyncratic about how we share our data, but we're systematic. So that I don't have to keep going back to the original data producer and hoping that somehow uh, there, there's a way we can interface with each other. So let me turn to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and tell you a little bit about this project. Uh, it started, as I said, about 20 years ago. Uh, it was a large community-based effort. It continues to grow. And it was, in many ways, an unprecedented project, an exemplar, if you will, of an early, what we're calling, you know, cyber science or e-science type of project. In uh, a couple of days of the Sloan Digital or SDSS survey, they acquired certain types of astronomy data that spanned and, and, and uh, surpassed all of the acquisition of astronomy data prior to that. So just to give you a sense of the scale. To give you a sense of where we are today, the modern astronomy projects that are coming online in the next few years in a week will acquire as much data as SDSS did. So there is an exponential growth in terms of how much data is being captured by these large scale projects. Uh, it's also something that in many ways democratized, if you want to call it that, the use of astronomy data. 
So the astronomers with SDSS acquire data and then eventually publish them on a website called SkyServer, uh, and they do so as a form, in the form of data releases, as they call them. They actually call them publications. And anyone can use SkyServer, and anyone can run queries uh, against SkyServer. There are apparently about 10,000 professional astronomers in the world, and there are over a million registered users of SkyServer. Now, not every one of them is active, no doubt, but even if a tenth of them are active, that's 10 times more uh, than there are professional astronomers. Uh, astronomers have taken images from SDSS and moved them into something called Galaxy Zoo, which is a, a website you can go to, you register, take a brief tutorial, and then you start classifying galaxies. You're given images of a galaxy, and you're asked, is this an elliptical, is it a spiral, is it an irregular, and so on. Uh, there was a Dutch school teacher that was doing this particular project, uh, Galaxy Zoo, and she discovered a blue object in one of the images. And they asked, and she asked the astronomers, you should fix this, there's something wrong here. And the astronomers looked at it and repeatedly kept saying, well, we don't see anything wrong in this image, we're not really sure what to tell you. And they pointed a telescope at that portion of the sky, and it turned out she discovered a new object and in fact has been named after her. So th there's actual scientific contribution taking place now at this point through these kinds of websites. This is a slide that shows what's called the data flow of the SDSS data. And if you start at the top left corner is the actual telescope uh, out in New Mexico that they've used to map uh, the northern sky using the SDSS, uh, for the SDSS data. And if you keep going you know, downward and to the right. You go through these levels of data. So the astronomers call the telescope data level zero. And they're literally bits. They're ones and zeros that come straight off the telescope. And there may be some calibration data, there may be some environmental data, you know, temperature data, so on, things like that. I am told that there may be a dozen people in the world who can interpret that data. And we've always joked, please don't put them in the same room, please don't put them in the same plane. Because they, these people basically are the only ones who can take that data and move it down this processing pipeline. When you get to something like level one, it is something that can be processed by an institution. So the Fermi Lab in Chicago is where those data are sent, and then there's a team of individuals who now start to work with it and use it. But you still pretty much have to be an expert in that instrument and that particular kind of data. By the time it reaches so-called level two, uh, it's now being housed in more familiar kind of technology stuff that is, you know, you can buy, stuff that's commodity, so on. And many astronomers in the world would be able to say, yeah, I understand what this is now. I can interpret this. I can use this. And at the very bottom right is the level three uh, data, or these databases, the data releases that I described that are put up on Sky Server. And at this point, anybody uh, can use them. And I, I really do mean anybody. When the Sky Server went live, there was a period of about six months where they tracked the usage of it. Uh, and the astronomers at Hopkins discovered that a high school in Orlando was the second largest user of SkyServer. So I don't know what this says, but they concluded they were about to be hacked. So they shut off access to this particular high school. And the principal of the high school contacted them and said, I have kids using real scientific data doing real work, and you just cut them off. So to the astronomers' credit, they turned around and said, we will now create a whole suite of K through 12 kind of educational applications and so on. So these data releases are really accessible. I don't just mean you have to be an expert. I don't mean you have to know about astronomy. Uh, you can use them in any way you want. When we started our work in terms of the archiving and preservation of these data, uh, I have to admit, we were overwhelmed. We, we sat there. None of us are astronomers. My colleagues and I don't have any professional training in astronomy. Uh, we sat there and started talking to these astronomers who would use terms, who would use, talk about methods and so on. We knew nothing about. Uh, we also knew we were talking about a lot of data. At the time, we didn't know how much, but we had a sense that this was a lot. So we tried to do something that was a little bit more tractable and basically said, is there something we can use that's familiar in terms of our world, in terms of the library, in terms of publishing, in terms of education, and so on? And what they said was, you know, there's actually a fourth level of data. So once we take these data releases and put them out and we do our analyses, we derive smaller chunks of data and those get cited in academic papers. So maybe you can start there. So in essence, that's what we did. We started looking at papers in astronomy and looking at figures and tables and things of that nature and seeing, oh, those are the level four data. Let's try and work 
some sort of preservation activity around those. Over time, they have asked us to go back up the pipeline. So initially, we started with level four, and they said, okay, we think you're getting a handle on this. Now can you deal with the databases themselves? Think we're getting a handle around this. How about the level two? And not that long ago, the lead astronomer in Hopkins, who's named Alex Soleil, actually came to me and said, there's data sitting on the telescope in New Mexico. I want you to go to New Mexico and get it. Uh, I, I have no idea what that data is or what, what, what the value is, but he seems to think that there's stuff that still hasn't been collected. So over time, we've been pushed up this pipeline and asked to deal more and more uh, with the raw, unfiltered, and unprocessed data. So this is a description, uh, a very high-level description, of course, of what kind of data you would see in the SDSS. And you know, raw data, of course, as you might imagine, it can be even the bits themselves. There's two kinds of data that's been encapsulated in, in this uh, that are important to note. Well, one is a catalog, which basically tells you about the data, how it's connected, what you can do with it, in some sense, that code book that I talked about earlier. And then there's this data archive server. Astronomers have basically taken a lot of these data and put them into databases, and then come up with new techniques and methods to access, query, and run analyses against those databases. And they did that basically because they were overwhelmed by the scale and complexity of what they were collecting. So you probably hear a lot, you read a lot about big data, uh, a term that gets used in, in the mainstream press even at this point. And there are lots of definitions about big data that talk about volume, velocity, viscosity, variety, and then those are all important and useful. But they're all very data-centric definitions. The definition that I've been using about big data is when a community has to develop new methods, it's big because they've been overwhelmed. And they have to come up with new ways of managing, describing, curating the data, and then run new methods against them. That's what happened to the astronomers with SDSS. So as we sat there and started thinking, okay, we are going to become one of the long-term homes and archives for these data. Uh, what are we up against? And we basically started taking some of the data releases. We started moving up that pipeline and bringing data into our environment. And then we were ready, at least we thought we were ready, to take the whole thing in. And we found out it's about 160 terabytes of data. And we do have it all on site now. Uh, and we do have two copies and we've done uh, the archiving work. But there was a little conversation earlier about ingestion processes and workflows and pipelines. We were completely broken by the ingestion process of bringing the SDSS data, and I'm not trying to be dramatic. Uh, the system administrator, my chief IT architect, and the software developers would literally come to me and say, can, can, we, can we back out of this, really? Do we have to do this? Because this is really killing us. And I said, no, we, we, we cannot back out of this. <laughs> We're going to have to figure this out. So I'll give you a, a taste of one kind of problem we encountered. There's a bit of a misconception that uh, big data is, is big, huge blobs of data. So in the 160 terabytes, maybe there's you know 10 terabyte chunks or something. This astronomy data, there are 80 million files. And some of them are really small, on the order of kilobytes. We did not anticipate that. And we are ingesting all of these files into our storage system, and it is grinding to a halt repeatedly. And we are not sure why. Even the astronomers couldn't have told us there are 80 million files. They would tell you, no, no, there are a lot. I mean, clearly, it's more than 10. It's more than 100. It's more than 1,000. But if I had said it's 80 million, they would have said, no, 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 of course not. It's not nearly that many files. So the storage system we are using is not configured to deal with large, fast flows of 80 million files into its, into its environment. This was compounded by the fact that we are keeping the copies on tape, on LTO4, and now we're moving to LTO6. So a couple of consequences of this. First thought was, OK, we have to package this stuff up. You know, we don't know, quite frankly, what the preservation implications might be of packaging it, because we can tell you how we made the package, but we're not astronomers. So we may not be packaging it in sort of semantically meaningful ways. We're just doing it from an efficiency perspective. But we have to do this. The system simply can't operate properly in this way. So life is good. We package them up. We bring them in the system. Performance improves. We're patting ourselves on the back. We're thinking life is good. Then we started to run fixity or att attach fixity information to it. 
and we discovered that the fixity wasn't granular enough. It was either happening at the block level of the storage system itself, which is what you got out of the box, or at the package level. So what happens if you run a fixity check later on and you're not sure if it's the block that's been compromised or if it's the package that's been compromised or if it's the underlying data, which elements of the underlying data have been compromised? These were not anticipated problems. We did not think about them in advance. We've been sort of retroactively trying to deal with them. And we've been talking to our storage vendor about this problem and to multiple storage vendors about this problem and they acknowledge it, but I'm not really sure they've given us a solution to it. And as we may be moving into object-based storage, the question of do you keep things in files, do you keep things in databases, or do you start thinking of them as objects? There are profound implications from a preservation perspective about this particular set of questions. And I, I don't have answers for you. I'm just saying there are very important questions that we have to address. So for all, all of the suffering that we've had over the last few years of this, uh, we took which I thought was uh, a fairly expected and predictable thing that an academic library would do, which was we put it out there for all to see. Uh, we basically said, here are the things we did. They didn't work. Here are the things we tried to fix it. And here are the things that maybe went, went okay. What I was surprised by is many of my colleagues who work in academic libraries basically said, thank you for doing this. You know, nobody else has done this. I can't go to some other public place and say, here are the issues we dealt with in ingesting large amounts of scientific data into our repository or into our archive. You seem to be the only guys willing to do this. And I think that's a problem. Uh, I mean, either the other institutions aren't fessing up or they haven't dealt with this kind of problem or they solved it, which would be great, and we definitely like to hear about it. But we think it's really important to put this information out there and try and find other, not just academic libraries, universities, but other content managers, I'll just call it that, who may have similar problem so that we can start to, to talk to each other and work with each other. And we classified these lessons learned according to that stack model that I showed you at the our earlier slide. So it's broken down into storage, archiving, preservation, and curation. The agreement that we had originally with the SDSS folks was to preserve their data. We haven't gotten there. We were so stuck on the archiving piece uh, that we're only now beginning to address some of the preservation problems, but they're still pressing problems. So a little bit about what I think are some similarities in terms of some of the issues that I've raised here. Uh, I mentioned to you that it was actually a presentation by John Landau, the producer of Avatar, that started making me think about these commonalities. And when I told him about this work, he actually said, yeah, I think there are some similarities there because when it comes to something like Avatar, they're producing these sort of raw data files, if you will, and then generating and processing them to create the things we see on the screen. And there's an interesting question about which of those things do you preserve? Do you not care? Do you just redo everything? Or do you try and keep some of them and then use them later on? In many ways, James Cameron was a pioneer in terms of what he was doing with film and the way these astronomers were with their data. They go ahead because there's an interesting problem or an interesting creative kind of activity they want to work with, and they just forge right ahead. They build new instruments, maybe new data formats, certainly new methods, and so on, and they do something really amazing. But they don't think about preservation. The, pres the astronomers kept saying, we preserve the data, and we would talk to them about what do you mean by that, and then they would say, actually, we haven't preserved the data. Here, you go preserve the data. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's a be careful what you wish for moment. Um, it, it's an incredible opportunity, quite frankly, from where I sit, it's an honor that they would trust us to try and do this. But it, it, it's not something they've considered in any way in an explicit manner as they started this. Even in astronomy, they're generating so much data now that they can't even keep all of the data on their drives. They have to analyze it and then dump it off their systems. So this is only going to get harder, not easier. And the kinds of technologies we've been using to date, I don't think are particularly well prepared. And it's not even the technologies themselves. It's also the approaches that we have, sort of the processes, the assumptions we have about policies. Oh yeah, of course we have to have two copies. It's really expensive and challenging to have two copies. Of course we can keep it on tape. It's really hard to read the packages off the tape. It's really hard to unbundle them off the tape. So even the policies we've generated need to be questioned. 
And I think, you know, I'm preaching to the choir, and, you know, I think the FBI presentation was awesome in terms of talking about this. We're dealing in new formats, new machines, new ways of acquiring data. Uh, as you know, the last couple of weeks in Baltimore have been very interesting for us. And a lot of that started because of one person's handheld cell phone video. It created a ripple effect that we're still feeling in the city. There's also this question of potential value. It's difficult to know what the potential value might be. I asked some astronomers, suppose we're using data and it isn't used for 5, 10, 15, 25, 30 years. Can we deaccession it? Can we move it out of the archive and, in essence, put a tombstone there saying, this used to be here, but we got rid of it? And they said, we know what you're asking. We get it. It's expensive. It's hard. It's all this stuff. But here's a real scenario. You do that, and then in 26 years, a supernova occurs in the sky. And the astronomers of that day go, oh, we know the Sloan folks mapped that portion of the sky. And we know Hopkins has a data archive that kept it. Oh, you got rid of it? How do you assess that in terms of keeping versus keeping or not keeping? So many of the industries represented here, I think, have very different audiences, have very different kinds of access provisions and so on. But I will also say that in terms of scientists, Film, video, audio is an incredibly important part of the research they do. And some films and some recordings and so on become part of cultural heritage. So there starts to be this sort of overlap between the academic or the cultural institutions and maybe the private entertainment uh, industry and so on. I, there are scientists at Hopkins who look at turbulence flow. So it's not even video that's generated by observing something. It's simulations, but they're still videos. Uh, and not surprisingly, many of them are also saying, what are you going to do for us? How are you going to help us? And I'm hoping that you have some answers I can give them. I think the technology requirements may start to converge, at least at the lower levels of that stack. Uh, and if they do, I think there's some value for us in, in terms of working together and talking together. So the, the last sort of technical concept I'll put out there is uh, what we call the, the information graph. So this is a project being funded by the Sloan Foundation called RMAP. Uh, and there's a, a protocol, an RDF-based protocol called the Object Reuse and Exchange, uh, or ORE, that talks about how you build compound objects that connect publications, that connect data, that connect software, video, audio, you name it, and creates these information graphs. And what those graphs do, in some sense, is give you a sense of how things are connected to each other. And what's the provenance? Where were things derived from? What machines or people touched those data, and what did they do with them? And I do note that in some cases, if you're, I was having lunch and talking with uh, Dirk Van Dahl about Major League Baseball and this amazing work they're doing, and the question I asked him was, are you using the same equipment in every stadium? And he said, yes. And I thought, wow, I wish I could do that. <laughs> I wish I could tell all the scientists, please use the following technology. I understand you have a greater degree of control in terms of what acquisition modes you use. But think about news. So the news media covering Baltimore had its cameras that I'm sure are industry standard, and they know exactly what to do with them. But people were taking video of fires. People were taking pictures of things that were happening. That's part of the news as well. And how you include that, how you preserve that, is not clear to me. But we're hoping that these information graphs may be a way to start expressing all those connections, expressing the provenance, so that we can start to think about it more explicitly. And I'll end with a slide that I, I, I'll call some grand challenges. I'd mentioned we've been talking to some of these storage vendors, and they, they are receptive, and they are open to hearing what we're saying. But I will also say there's a bit of a sometimes not even an undercurrent, but an explicit one of, you know, this is, this is not a common problem. What you're describing is such an edge case that if we built something just for you, you know, it's not marketable, it's not so on and so on. I can't help but think other libraries and other universities are going through this as well, but I also can't help but think that other people and other industries are going through this as well. And it's not going to be enough for Hopkins or even universities to go to the storage industry and say, we need you to do these things from a preservation perspective. I think many industries are going to have to come together uh, and make this kind of message, uh, take this kind of message to them. And then the final thing I'll talk about is, I have asked many of my colleagues, and I read lots of papers, show me an example of a successful format migration of scientific research data. And I've yet to see one. 
if you have such examples in your community, we would love to learn from you because this is a bridge we have yet to cross, but I'm sure we will do so soon enough. So I'll end with uh, a few acknowledgements and a few resources you can look at for further information. If we have time, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you.